Ray Kirk here, a uh, senior research consultant to ARCH. Um, my primary activity uh, for the past 10 years or so has been uh, facilitating uh, the beginnings of this process of developing a research agenda. I'd just like to get an idea of how familiar uh, everyone is with the uh, final report um, and, and possibly links of recommendations uh, that the uh, expert panel uh, put forth. And it's, uh, now well, it's looking like we have some, some very and a bunch of people who have some exposure um, and maybe a little more than a quarter who are not familiar. Okay, that's useful for me to, um, to gauge uh, some of my comments. I, I appreciate that. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to uh, share some background on the origins of Arch's uh, respite uh, agenda. Um, as Greg said, that at about uh, 2010, shortly thereafter, um, the Administration for Community Living was developing an emerging interest in uh, establishing the uh, evidence base for these services. It, early on, there was a sense that respite was being underutilized nationally, but at the same time, uh, it appeared to be among the most requested services for uh, people who were caring for uh, people in need of, of uh, you know, family level caregiving. So uh, this led to a kind of an essential question, which is what does the research say about the efficacy of respite? And uh, in 2012 and 13, uh, Arch conducted the literature review that, uh, that uh, Jill mentioned earlier, where we uh, reviewed dozens of studies that um, were subsequently published in the form of an annotated bibliography uh, that has been updated about six uh, times now, well, five times, we're in the fifth edition. Um, but dating back to the beginning, um, there were some positive findings. Um, uh, we found that, uh, for example, respite can reduce stress, uh, can reduce sleep deprivation, and can reduce the sense of um, uh, burden of care among uh, caregivers. Uh, we also uh, learned that uh, there were some positive trends with respect to quality of life indicators, such as caregivers' health and family relationships. Uh, and when the respite service focused on children, there was evidence of reduced risk of child abuse and the uh, child abuse potential. But the review also revealed many challenges. Uh, there was a lack of clarity about the intended recipient of respite in the literature. Often the care receiver was monitored, but not the caregiver. Uh, in some cost studies, the caregiver was not even mentioned, uh, the focus being entirely on costs and cost savings relating to certain undesirable outcomes, such as uh, care receiver placement or hospitalization. Uh, there was a lack of model clarity and categorization. Uh, we observed that respite ranged from occasional, irregular, infrequent use of in-home services provided by volunteers or family members, all the way to formal weekly or even daily place-based respite with professional paid staff, uh, quite a range. The two models with the most apparent evidence at that time were crisis care nurseries and adult day services, uh, both place-based um, uh, care options. Uh, there was a lack of objective standardized outcome measures. Very few studies included pre-post measurement, relying primarily on self-report, which although valuable is highly subjective and more prone to response bias. And there were, uh, was weak efficacy testing um, and, and weak outcome evaluation. Very few comparison group studies, many studies without outcome measures relating to caregivers at all. Next slide, please. So in consultation with the Administration for Community Living, uh, ARCH began the process of developing a prospective research agenda uh, to address these issues. The importance of this research is, uh, is very apparent and, and we constructed this uh, schematic to illustrate that. Uh, both model development and efficacy testing is needed uh, in order to build evidence for the efficacy of respite care, if indeed it is an efficacious service. An efficacious surface should be, uh, uh, should result or lead to improvements in the lives and well-being of caregivers and others involved in the respite care environment, including care receivers, family members, and even the community. Uh, with such evidence, the possibility for successful program advocacy and increased funding 
becomes possible. Next slide, please. So to get the, the, the project started, beginning in 2014, a group of 16 volunteers met six times over a period of 18 months. Volunteers included researchers, policy analysts, and executives, uh, representatives from philanthropic foundations, and others, all of whom became ARCH's expert panel. Uh, the membership list is available in your packets, uh, at least via a link. Uh, the goals of the expert panel were to take a deep dive into the current status of respite research with the intention of constructing an inclusive uh, respite definition followed by the development of a research framework. Uh, they were then to make specific recommendations for prospective research addressing each of these remaining topics, such as methodological issues, translation research, identifying and engaging researchers and identifying funders. Next slide, please. The first work product, which took nearly six months to achieve, was the development of an inclusive definition of respite. Uh, it reads, uh, respite is planned or emergency care that provides a family caregiver some time away from caregiver responsibilities and results in some measurable improvement in the well-being of the caregiver the care recipient and or the family system. Now, as the asterisks suggest, this was a pre-COVID effort. Uh, and while I think the, the definition still hangs uh, together on its face, uh, obviously the, the COVID-19 experience has presented new challenges with respect to actually delivering respite. We'll hear much more about that going forward. Uh, but in effect, what this definition does is it makes the caregiver the portal of entry to any outcome study on respite. And then collateral beneficiaries, such as the care receiver or the family, can be added with appropriate outcome measures of their own. In addition to the definition, the expert panel also developed a research study flow diagram, a taxonomy of terms for respite research, a catalog of standardized measures and guidance for parochial measures, a matrix of study designs of increasing complexity and rigor, along with measurement and data analysis strategies for those studies. All of this is presented in the final report, which again can be uh, accessed through the link in your package. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when all was said and done with the expert panel's other goals, the panel produced six major recommendations, uh, which are depicted here, as you saw a few minutes ago, as the key to success for research endeavors moving forward. These six major research uh, topics are, beginning with number one, improved, pardon me, improved research methods. Uh, it's important to vary the rigor in accordance with the level of program development even at the level of constructing independent and dependent variables. Equally important are appropriate measurement strategies and appropriate measures. Uh, number two, research on individual, family, and societal outcomes. Specifically, how does respite result in improved quality of life for caregivers and collateral beneficiaries, and how does it produce other desired outcomes for family and community? Three, uh, they recommended research on cost benefit and cost effectiveness that includes contextual variables, not just large system level costs, but rather to include consideration of such things as out of pocket costs of family caregivers and other costs uh, nested in the provision of respite by families, uh, not just uh, costs uh, to fund respite care per se. Uh, number four, uh, research on system change that improves respite access. Again, not just administrative changes, but changes that improve access by overcoming identified barriers such as geography, access across different cultures, racial identities, economic strata, and, and other barriers evident in the published research. Number five, research on improving respite uh, provider competence. Different caregivers and care receivers require respite caregivers, whether voluntary or paid, with different skill levels, requiring different training levels, and, and also assured levels of competence. Therefore, training, credentialing, and even licensure may need to be considered, as well as assessing basic competencies. And finally, translation research that informs policy and practice, 
Positive research findings can be most successfully implemented by model adopters when they know important contextual variables, organizations' readiness for change, required resources, required training, and so on. Next slide, please. So what followed these recommendations? Well, ARCH and the Administration for Community Living published and disseminated the expert panel's final report. ARCH formed the Respite Research Consortium, which is a group of former published respite researchers, persons currently conducting respite research, rising scholars with a demonstrated interest in respite, as well as other interested parties, including foundations and practitioners. ARCH then endeavored to identify potential funding sources for new research and to connect consortium members to those funding sources. And finally, ARCH committed to convene a respite research summit in 2020 to discuss the findings and the, of current and uh, uh, ongoing respite research in order to inform and guide future activities undertaken by ARCH uh, as we move forward uh, with our next cooperative agreement with the Administration for Community Living. Next slide, please. So here we are. Uh, this is the summit. Uh, I want to uh, add my personal welcome uh, for your participation in the summit. I want to express my appreciation for your interest and your attendance. Uh, for the rest of today's session and uh, for tomorrow, uh, we will, as Jill suggested earlier, highlight current research in relation to the expert panel's framework, including assessing progress on the panel's six key recommendations. All of the presenters, <coughs> pardon me, are actively engaged in respite research. Uh, panelists represent a variety of interests relating to respite, including research, policy analysis, administration, and funding. In addition to the presentations and the panel discussions for tomorrow, we will host breakout sessions for all participants at the summit to offer their ideas and suggestions and observations uh, that hopefully will help guide ARCH's future activities. Um, and at the end of tomorrow's session, we hope to present some ideas about next steps and uh, to extend an invitation to all of you to remain involved, either by joining the research consortium if you're not already a member, or by participating in follow-up roundtable discussions. Uh, next slide, please. So for the remaining, um, looks like about five minutes, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about uh, the summit or the origins of the project. Um, please feel free to uh, either unmute yourself and, and speak up or use the chat box. Um, and again, thanks for your participation. Um, any questions? Dr. Kirk, this is Kim Whitmore. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm looking at the chat and I don't see any questions at this time, um, but for those who are in the audience, anyone that has questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. If you have questions for Ronnie Snyder as well, um, this is a great time to, to ask those. We have just a couple minutes before we transition to the next presentation. Um, Ray, you do have a comment that says, I think this presentation was a great framing of the work. Thank you, Ray. And then we have a comment from Jennifer Rosenbaum that says, creating a common definition of respite is key, yet different programs and services have different definitions based on funding source, et cetera. So, Ray, I don't know if you have a comment um, oh, to that oh, yeah. comment. Yes, I do. I, I mentioned somewhat jocularly that it took six months to arrive at that definition. If you uh, use your link and access the, um, the full report and you turn to the page that has that definition, you will find at the bottom of that page a very lengthy paragraph that provides all of the qualifications and the, the varied interests that people representing the different parochial interests or funding streams or uh, service populations wanted to assure could be successfully connected to that definition. So that is certainly something that came up. Uh, it's one of the reasons that the definition took so long to develop. Um, and it's a point well taken both now and going forward. Great, Ray, you have um, a comment in the chat that's from Dr. Peshin. It says from the report, um, oh, it's the, the definition posted for folks. So um, those of you who want to read that full definition, you can see that in the chat again. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. Peshin. And then Ray from Don Williamson. Hi, Don. 
<laughs> um, it says, thanks, Ray. I can thoroughly recommend the research agenda paper. I return to it frequently. And that is from our international partner across the globe. So that's great to hear. Um, and then lots of appreciation for you, Ray. And then a comment from Jill Kagan that this definition in particular was developed for future uh, respite research purposes. And then a comment from Leanne Winchester, the MA Lifespan Respite, Massachusetts Lifespan Respite, completed a similar exercise creating a statewide definition of respite. We are working on distributing the definition, getting buy-in from all programs. Great, well, thanks for those, those comments. Um, we're coming up on about a minute. Um, thanks everyone again for uh, the attention and the comments. Uh, any other comments, uh, drop them in the chat box.